everybody got another great guest today. Caroline Podolicchio is on the show today. She is a former Division I athlete, and she really talked to us about what it takes uh, to make Division I in any level in her journey uh, to the NHL, where she now works with the Capitals uh, out of Washington, of course. Uh, she also is a community manager there and is heavily involved in their reading program, uh, which might be a groaner for your kids listening, but we really did dive into the importance of reading and, and how... Uh, you know, it's an aspect of the game uh, in terms of just sharpening your mind and how that's important for you. So great episode today. Uh, make sure you listen to it. Also, in in the spirit of reading, uh, if you haven't already done so, check out our book that Christy and I wrote called When Hockey Stops. Uh, it's a book about dealing with mental adversity. Uh, we have gotten nothing but positive reviews back from this. It is not something you have to wait until your kid is dealing with something. We actually think it's better if you're not in that situation, but uh, you can get it over at whenhockeystops.com. You can get it at hockeywraparound.com, or you can get it at, as of course you know, ourkidsplayhockey.com. But uh, summer reading's coming up. Um, we've had just such wonderful success with uh, schools and, and children reading this book. So if you're looking for that little extra gift for the end of the school year, uh, it's a great option for you. But without further ado, let's get you into the episode with Caroline Podolicchio. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and I'm joined by two people who shout positive messages at the glass, Mike Benelli and Christy Casciano burns And today, we are joined by a former Division I NCAA all-academic player who earned a bachelor's in psychology from Colgate University before pursuing a master's in tourism admin with a concentration in sports management from George Washington University. That is a nice little resume there. The Bethesda, Maryland native. Is a coach for the Chevy Chase Hockey Club, and perhaps most exciting, is the director for fan development for the Washington Capitals, the team you might have heard of in the Metropolitan Division. My friends, please welcome to the show, Caroline Podolicchio. Caroline, welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thank you so much for having me, Lee. I'm, I'm happy to be here, so I'm excited to connect on all things hockey. Yeah, no, we're, we're excited to have you, and we got to... Great bunch of questions today. We're going to talk about your role with the Capitals. We're going to talk about hockey. But we always like to start with someone's origin story. We know that you played for the Montgomery Blue Devils as a kid. How did you discover the game? How did you get into the game? How did the game push your life to where you're at today? Kind of a funny story. So I, uh, I as a three-year-old, I took lessons after school. Um, they were free to kids five and under. And I would head to the rink uh, and take lessons with my classmates after school is kind of like a after school activity. And I started with figure skates. So um, gr growing up with four brothers, I quickly realized that I wanted to, you know, be in the same skates as them and they were in hockey skates. And I made the transition from figure skating to hockey, hockey skates pretty quickly. Uh, once I saw that I was, um, you know, different from them, wanted to be like them. I love that. You know, it's a common tale, the 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 figure skating to, to hockey. Nothing wrong with figure skating. I never I never rip on figure skating. But yeah, if you have four brothers, I can totally understand. Um, so here's a question for you. I was doing some research on you, right? It always makes guests a little freaked out. But <laughs> you did some significant travel in the later years of youth hockey, right? How mm -hmm. did you and your family manage that? And looking back, was it worth it? And please feel free to tell the audience the type of travel you were doing. Yeah, absolutely. So when I made the transition from uh, boys hockey to girls hockey, there wasn't a ton of uh, girls teams in Maryland yet. Um, now it's exploded. But at the time, we were playing in a, a league in Maryland that was against the boys. It was full body contact checking as a girls team. Um, so we played all the same rules that the boys did. Um, but we wanted to kind of, you know, get exposure to playing girls hockey. So um, we went out to the Midwest League, played against all, you know, the best teams in, in girls hockey at the time. Uh, we went went out there once a month, played five games in a weekend, which I'm, I think about now, and I'm like, I, I don't know how we did that. Five <laughs> yeah. full hockey That's games. That's crazy. In a yeah. I mean, I it, it makes me tired thinking about it. But so we play five games, usually – got it handed to us they were they were really talented I mean a lot of the you know the girls that you've seen in the Olympics were on those teams at the time so um we we made it work it was a lot of fun to travel with teammates and um you know be given that opportunity to play at the highest level um in girls hockey so um we made it work and I had you know really dedicated parents that uh you know 
kind of bent over backwards to get me there and get get me to where I was. So very grateful for that. Yeah, and curious because a lot of moms are always on the fence about and dads too about making the switch to all girls hockey. Mm-hmm. I hear the debate all the time. You hear the moms say, no, you want to keep the boys as long as they can because they get tougher. But I found that when I made the switch with my daughter, it was better hockey for her. Um, And she was able to bond more quickly because she didn't have to be outside of the locker room to get dressed and all that. What did you find as far as making that switch and what age would you recommend? That's a really good question. I I do think it it can be different for everyone, but you know, looking back on it, I was devastated as a 13 year old to, to be cut from the the boys program. It was kind of that natural shift where they, you know, thought it was appropriate for a girl to be playing on a girl's team and, and not playing with the boys anymore. So I think, you know, there was some factors that played into it, but I would say that you're totally right. I think, you know, being able to have that camaraderie and, um, you know, girls for teammates and being able to bond with them a little quicker and have those locker room moments um, is really important. Uh, And I think, you know, you know, off the ice and the bonds you have with your teammates off the ice translation translates on the ice. So I think you're spot on there. Uh, And then I think that the, um, the game of hockey is a little different on the girl side. There's more finesse um, at least, you know, from all the hockey I've watched, I think, you know, they move the puck differently. It it requires a lot of finesse. So I think, you know, that transition for me at 13 was probably a good age. I, you know, I had, you know, a couple years in middle school to kind of get acclimated with the girls teams. And then, um, you know, that kind of prepared me for high school at the, um, you know, the prep school level. Uh, so I think, I think that age was appropriate. Um, but I also was, you know, as I was playing boys hockey, I was playing on, I was a dual roster kid. So I was playing with the girls teams while playing boys hockey. So I had a little bit of um, both worlds um, at growing up. Yeah. Great advice. I'm, I'm glad you shared that with the parents listening because they, uh, I hear that debate all the time in the, the lobbies of hockey rinks all over. So yeah, I'm, it's great to weigh in on that. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your journey. So college hockey and then your degrees, you honed it on something that you could use hockey as part of your career. Absolutely. Uh, I always loved the community. So, you know, kind of being where I am today, I, I look back and I, it, it's crazy to, to me, like I'm, you know, living the dream and um, you know, working for the Washington Capitals, my home team that I grew up cheering for uh, is pretty incredible. So really lucky there. But, you know, when I went to Colgate and I majored in psychology, I had a, a few different uh, career ideas. Like, you know, one of them was, you know, going back to uh, boarding school or a school and coaching and teaching. Um, I also played with the idea of kind of pursuing you know, an athletic director type role. Uh, so there was a few different kind of career trajectories, but I think what kickstarted it all and trying to stay in sports was my internship with the Colgate Athletic Department. I interned with them summer going into my senior year and I trained on campus ahead of my senior season. So um, kind of being exposed to college sports and, and the marketing world really kickstarted my passion for trying to pursue a career in sports, I would say. Yeah. Colgate's in my neck of the woods. Great college. <laughs> Stop bragging. I loved Christy. it. We got good colleges down here in Pennsylvania too. Okay. It's not <laughs> really... uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing down a ton of questions here. Um, one thing I just want to reiterate, it, it's so important as you just, you just kind of shared with us that if you love the game, you can stay involved with the game beyond playing. And and again, I've always said this, you play as long as you can. Don't, don't, mm-hmm. this isn't like someone saying don't play, play as long as you possibly can. I still play, you know, but if you want to have a life in the game, you're not limited to just playing the game. There are so many different roles and you named a few there from athletic director 
uh, to community, to everything. And, and community management is a lot of fun. I have to ask this now that you brought it up because you mentioned the Capitals. Where were you in 2018? How was that Stanley Cup run for you as a Caps fan? There's, <laughs> o- there's only the one. And, and again, maybe for our younger audience, they need to understand this. The Caps were plagued. They, they were a Maple Leaf level type situation where they just couldn't win right? They couldn't get past the second round and you, you overcame the Penguins and you won against the Vegas Knights. Tell me as the fan, what was that like for you? It was incredible. I mean, when they, just their whole run was unbelievable. Um, we watched every game as, you know, my group of friends watched every game together. And then, you know, the night they won, I was right in Chinatown, <laughs> um, right next to Capital One Arena. And, you know, even though they're, they were away, it felt like they were home. It was right. just, I mean, it's hard to describe the energy that that city brought. Um, but, yeah, we were uh, right next, we were at a local restaurant bar. Um, and when they won, we flooded the streets right in front of Capital One Arena. Um, I'm sure you've seen pictures, but just in, absolutely insane. Um, and, yeah, I, I would say the feeling of, like, just, per, you know, getting past the first round was huge. Like, you know, there's something special about like the fact that we finally had kind of moved on uh, past, you know, what we we had done in the past for so long. We, there was a little bit of a curse on us, I would say, for <laughs> for a while, but broke that. And um, yeah, I just was surrounded by friends that had followed the Caps for years. Um, my fiance, he's a hockey player, so he's a huge Caps fan. So, you know, being together in that moment was really cool um, and being, you know, a fan in that moment was really cool. Right. Um, and I know many of my colleagues enjoyed being here, you know, working the moment and being a part of it as like a part of the organization. But I wouldn't, um, you know, I hope to, I hope to that we can run it back while while I'm here and while I'm working here. But I okay. I wouldn't trade it for the world that, uh, you know, that I was able to experience as a fan. Well, I'll say two things. So those of you listening to the show, she has a huge smile on her face. Um, I asked this question because uh, I'm a Flyers fan and I was not around in 74 and 75. So I have no idea what it feels like to win a Stanley Cup championship. So I'm always very curious about, about what that must be like. And uh, again, the Capitals at this point in time, chasing another massive record with, with Ovechkin, obviously, uh, which is going to be a a franchise changer in a lot of different ways. So the one question I wanted to go back to, um, you know, we've discussed on the show many times, especially Mike and I, just the transition to, to women's hockey, to girls hockey, Um, And, you know, this question popped in my mind uh, because obviously girls transition to girls hockey, boys don't. So with that said, there's perspective there that that Mike and I are not going to understand. So what is the difference from your point of view? What are the differences when you switch to girls hockey that maybe the boys don't notice or don't see? Great point. So I I would say I feel like my first thing that I'm going to get off you know, my chest is that women's hockey is really physical. I mean, at the collegiate level, you are seeing a lot of body contact. And I think there is, you know, that obvious rule that like you can't, checking is not allowed, but there is body contact and checking. I mean, um, you can't do open ice hits. You'll, you'll get a penalty, but the physicality of women's hockey is there. Um, And, and it will be um, going forward. And then I, I think one difference is just the way we move the puck, um, the finesse on the ice and the way uh, girls and women pass the puck and um, move the puck up the ice is just is totally different. Um, and I, I think those are the the two. Those are the two big uh, differences, I think, between boys and girls and and women and men's hockey. Yeah. And I can attest to that. My daughter. Uh just finished playing college hockey it's physical (laughs) and everybody thinks it's for it's not you're sadly mistaken uh because yeah they um they protect their goalie just like the guys do you know and they're body checking and yeah it it can get extremely physical you know Mm -hmm. yeah i'd say anyone who's watched any college women's college hockey world championship hockey or the olympics sees it because <laughs> it's obvious right it's obvious once you start watching it uh, and yeah, it's I could, fast I could, too it's a fast game go ahead mike no i could imagine those those uh back in college you know playing shannon uh in the corner uh you know uh, from from a defense perspective you know she didn't uh she's not a uh 
stick on puck first person. You know, so I think, <laughs> you know, so I, think I think it's you know when you when you watch the women's game and 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 just see how physical it is when you actually are on the bench. Um, mm-hmm. it, it it and it is actually it's it's more similar to and we use this in in the youth hockey world. It's more similar to an actual youth hockey game than an NHL game. I mean, because it isn't a full out, you know, body contact at center ice blowing somebody up. It really is the body position and boxing out and, you know, establishing your lane and 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 protecting the puck. So it really does. I mean, the women's game, I think, when you watch it um, with your kids, represents the game of hockey much closer than an NHL game does, um, you know, at the youth level. So I think it's a great, you know, if you're a parent out there and you're and you're looking for you know, things that are, that are reality. I mean, you know, Alex Ovechkin isn't, you know, he's not reality, right? He's not, that's a, not a normal human being. He's a freak of nature. So, you know, you're not going to get a player like that at any level, let alone men's and women's. So I think for us as the, at the youth level, you know, watching the women's college game and even the pro game represents more of what, like the, 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 the pieces of hockey that we want to teach um, are right there front and center for us to see. So I, but I would agree. It's not, um, it's not something where you're like, well, there's just no, there's no, you know, you're not allowed to touch anybody out there. And I think it's, right. it's definitely it's, a misconception. That is a yeah. misconception. And as being of Alex Ovechkin, I just finished watching that documentary on him. He, he's not a human being. I mean, he's like, he's a machine. Wow. Yeah. It was incredible. Well, bo- both his parents he were is, Olympians. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. Well, Caroline, have you, do you have much contact with him? And what, what can you tell us? What is he like off the ice? He, all the players, all the Washington Capitals players are are great off the ice. Um, I do work directly with them on all community initiatives. So, um, you know, I get to connect with them on, you know, what they're passionate about in the community and, and work with them directly on programming. So he's, you know, he's a joy to be around. He, uh, you know, he's, he's a great guy. So um just as much of a great guy off the ice as he is on on the ice we've actually interviewed uh jen o'brien uh on on this uh podcast a number of times and and uh you know jen's a huge fan of him and your you know what you guys do as a community from the uh from the american special hockey association standpoint so i know you know obviously your involvement but the, but the fact that these players you know don't need to be uh prodded and coaxed to go do these kind of events is really a tribute to you know really what today's NHL player really is and understands about you know connecting with the community 100% yeah i w- i would say hockey players are you know a different breed when it comes to community they they want to be out in the community and and working you know with the community and you know with our fans so we're real i, I feel really lucky to kind of be in the sport um working directly with them on on these community initiatives and yeah Ovechkin does a lot of work with Asha um he's a big supporter of theirs so um that's been really cool to you know see you know as I kind of get up to speed with all the community initiatives that the Caps have been doing over the years and jumping off that your so your fan development um what does that mean and how do you do it and and is it changing for you yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, I think the biggest thing about hockey is that I it's the best live sport to to watch, um, in my personal opinion. I, I might be a little biased, but, you know, just seeing a game in person is a totally different experience um, than watching it on TV. And I think, you know, introducing the sport to new fans is, is the biggest part of my role. So uh, I work on you know, the different NHL platforms uh, that the the NHL um, oversees, all the clubs kind of participate in different platforms. And I oversee all those for the Capitals. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have our Caps in School program. So kind of introducing kids to the Caps um, in a, you know, a curriculum-based level um, with our reading program. So just kind of introducing them to to the game and, you know, what it's all about and trying to motivate them to, you know, incorporate reading in their daily lives through prizing and, you know, engagement from the cap side. Uh, so yeah, there, it, 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 everything is, you know, evolving all the time when it comes to creating new fans and uh, growing the game. So, you know, keeping up to speed with, 
you know, what people want to see or, you know, what kind of platforms they're engaging with is, is really important um, as we kind of develop that new generation of fans. You know, Carolyn, you get me thinking here. I'm just thinking about location here, right? So, you know, we got to remember here where the, the capitals are located. You know, you're not too far from Philadelphia up north and you're in that DMV area all the way down to Virginia. The next team really is is Raleigh, right? It's the, it's the Carolina hurricane. So how do you manage that landscape? Because, you know, D.C. is very small as a city itself, right, mm -hmm. as a district. Uh, so you have to attack De Delaware, uh, Maryland, Virginia, anywhere else, or, or is it a far reaching environment? What's your radius, right? Is basically yeah. what I'm saying. No, yeah. That's a good question. I, um, my youth hockey development team is really in tune with this. So they work, um, they work at introducing a game, like all across DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, I know for a lot of things, we have a 75 mile radius. So it's definitely, um, you know, we're not, we're not just focused on, uh, DC I, Metro, I guess, right? yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, no, I think, uh, our youth hockey team does a really good job at introducing the game across all different types of school districts. So one of the programs that they have is the hockey school program and they bring that program, um, into school systems and introduce hockey at the, um, within the PE curriculum. Um, and that has actually, um, over 750,000 students have been introduced oh. to the game wow. of hockey through that program. Wow. So, um, I, I credit the youth hockey team and, and everything they're doing to, um, kind of make sure that we are introducing hockey beyond, you know, that, that Metro reason, uh, region. Yeah. It, it's an interesting area because it technically, the Capitals are the first Southern team. If you want to look at the Mason Dixon line basis of it. And the further you go down South uh, it's amazing to watch how youth hockey kind of, I guess, spreads out in the sense of not in a good way. Right. Uh, I mean, the farther South you go, there's no, there's not a lot of high school teams in some places there are no high school hockey. So part of your role is not just developing the Capitals, right. It's developing the game in general. Um, and, and again, if you're in a Northern city, that's probably not a challenge, right? If you're in Minnesota, it's definitely not a challenge. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of follow up on that of, you know, what are the challenges you're seeing? Uh, is it access? Is it information? Is it, you know, uh, do people know the capitals once you get into to kind of central Virginia? I mean, I know they know them, but do you know what, you know what I mean by that? Yeah. 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 I, uh, I think the NHL and all the organizations are doing a really good job trying to break down the barriers of access. So um, obviously hockey is an expensive sport. Um, and, and we all know that equipment's expensive, ice time's expensive. Um, so I think, you know, one of the programs that our, our youth hockey team leads is the learn to play program. And, mm -hmm. you know, you see that across the NHL organizations, but that is really helping kind of break down that barrier of cost because it's a, it's a really nominal fee for getting equipment issued to you and and getting those you know eight to ten weeks of sessions that introduce you to the game of hockey and you you learn how to play um so i think yeah you you nailed it i think access you know trying to break down those bar barriers of costs um i think rink access also um although you know we're i, th I think the game has grown a lot in our area um you know, they call it the Ovechkin effect. Uh, so <laughs> I think, I think that, you know, we're, we're growing the sport um, and, and seeing an increase in um, participation uh, for, for both boys and girls, um, especially girls. Girls has grown a lot in our area. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think access is the biggest barrier for sure. So I wanted to ask this too. Um, you have to be very driven to work for an NHL franchise, uh, man or woman, right? To, to, there's a lot of people that apply for these jobs, typically in the thousands. Um, you landed one. You were an NCAA Division One athlete. So look, there's something in you that is a driving factor. So I want to talk to the young girls and boys listening to the show right now from your perspective. You were a Division One NCAA athlete. We just shared on our Facebook group recently the odds of making it to NCAA hockey out of high school, all three divisions, and the odds are not in your favor ever. Uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't chase your dream. It doesn't mean you shouldn't drive to achieve your dream, but it does mean you need to put the work in to make it happen. 
-hmm. what's different about you or what is the driving factor in you that made that decision is I'm going to be a division one athlete. I'm going to work in this game. No one's going to tell me I can't do it. And I'm not, again, I'm not just focused on woman male here. It's you as a person speak to our audience a little bit about what that takes. Definitely. I, I would say that, you know, your mental performance is, is just as um, important as you know, the training you're doing on and off the ice, like, phys- like the physical performance. Um, I read a book in high school that I think kind of changed everything for me. It was called Mind Gym. Um, and it, it was all about, you know, kind of having that positive outlook um, and goal setting. And I think, uh, I think that just changed the la- landscape for me. I actually never thought I would ever play Division One hockey. Um, so going, you know, going away to Choate, I, I was pursuing division three. I was, you know, I had my eyes focused on the NESCACs and, and going D3, um, and, and potentially actually playing three sports in college. So, um, (laughs) I loved all, all three sports I played. So I, what were the other two real quick? Uh, lacrosse and field hockey. Okay. I knew it. it. I was all all forms of hockey. Got it. No, just just kidding. (laughs) They've got a stick in your hand. Exactly. (laughs) Hand eye coordination. Um, yes. So, yeah. So I, I really thought I was going to kind of pursue more than one sport in college and, and you, most people, you know, can't, I, there are some exceptions. Um, my brother, he played football and, uh, baseball and at, at the D one level, but um, most people can't do that at the D1 level. It's a it's a year round commitment to play right. sport at D1. So I would say that you know just kind of changing that um, my narrative mentally and and being like focusing on the positives, being present in the moment, um, and doing everything you can to kind of work on yourself and you know be the best version of yourself um, in the moment is really important. Um, and I, I got really into goal setting. I, I would say in, in high school, I would, you know, make five goals and put them on a piece of paper and read them before games. Um, and, and, you know, b- before big milestones. And I think that kind of helped get me to where I am today, for sure. You know, yeah, I'm a big <laughs> advocate of that too, writing down your goals, setting them, achieving them, visualizing it. Uh, do you still play Caroline? I do. I do. Right. <laughs> um, I play, you know, just like recreationally. Um, I, I play in a, a guy's league in a men's league um, just for fun. Um, Chevy Chase Club, which, uh, you know, the mites that I coach there, I, I get the chance to play on their outdoor rink um, in the winter. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And then I also, I, typically play in a um, league called the mullet league which is a lot of fun <laughs> I know that was a little um, dangerous yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm taking it I'm, I'm getting married at the end of august so oh I, congratulations I, I, fantastic yeah. um so i told myself that i'm going to take um this spring off from that league just to make sure i'm, I'm ready to go for the wedding day so <laughs> let's be honest we all know you're an adult league all-star you might not say it, but I'm going to say it. Uh, I, I wanted to say this, Caroline. Look, we've had a lot of professionals on this show, including yourself, uh, professional athletes, professional people. Um, the same three things keep coming back. For all the parents listening to your this show, I want you to know this is something you can learn, you can teach your kids, you can focus on. Caroline, they all say this, and you just said it. Be present. Focus on what you control. Write mm-hmm. out your goals. Right? We're, we're all, Absolutely. as parents, very quick to tell our kids how to play the game, even though a lot of us don't play, you can be quick to tell your kids, let's learn how to be present. Let's focus on what we control. Let's learn how to write goals. You can have a, you can have an eight-year-old write goals out. The goals might be play Fortnite or Zelda or whatever, but get in the, you can practice these things. I'm, I'm going to say it's a reoccurring theme, right? Mike, Christy, right? It's like every professional person we have on their show says these things. And these are people that have accomplished the goal of being involved in sports. I, I just be, be remiss if well, I didn't. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, think, I think the frustrating piece from a development standpoint is, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you learned a lot of that stuff going to Choate and obviously, you know, right in, in your youth hockey world, there must have been some influences there that led you down that path. And I think maybe, and, and I'm assuming a lot of it was because of the people that you were associating yourself with as well, right? That the other athletes 
when you go to a chote or a prep school environment, uh, you're not going, you know, to be in the locker room with underachievers, right? So the, the ability, now, and there's a lot of pressure that comes along with that, I'm sure as well, right? That, that mm-hmm. okay, because everybody in the room is, well, not everybody, but the people that are going to advance are writing their goals, are mm-hmm. being mindful, are in the moment, or, you know, they're all competing to be uh, the most stable athletes they can so that they can work on their training and their and and the, the on ice development, but I think you know maybe you could speak to that a little bit. You know when you made that jump from you know recreational hockey and, and you know obviously it's competitive hockey, but now going into an environment of of girls and women from all over the country, really all over the world, and and then seeing like how did that motivate you being in that locker room to to because you learn these things right. So um, being in that locker room and maybe how do you influence some of the athletes that were in that room with, with you. You know, right. How do you get over any intimidation you might have experienced too? Yeah, because now yeah. you're in a room. You know, you're not you're right. not in Maryland anymore, right? You're 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 in a you're in a, a place where every single girl that's in that locker room uh, has a has an expectation and a goal to get somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I'm and I'm assuming that every single person on your prep school team went off to play Division One college hockey. So, you know, what mm-hmm. what is it that you feel you learned and and some of the things you can you know. Uh, you know, present to some of the youth hockey players and, and really parents, because they're listening to this as well and saying, well, if I just get to the right school, the, the all that on ice and all that training is going to help my kid. But what, is, what, what are the other aspects that they have to be aware of? Absolutely. I think, you know, the, you talked about intimidation and, and kind of, you know, once you get to a prep school or, you know, a college team, like you aren't the best person in the room anymore. And you kind of have to let go of that. Um, there, These people, you know, these girls and women are like the best of the best coming in from different um, parts of the world. And, you know, I quickly realized that at the collegiate level um, that, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, I, I was surrounded by talent and excellence. And, um, you know, these those those women they pushed me to kind of be the better version of myself so Mm. um I think you get over the intimidation because you realize that you are surrounded by you know excellent hockey players and on and off the ice and um you learn so much from them so I think I think the biggest thing to take away is when you go into a new team you want to you want to position yourself to learn from your teammates rather than like be intimidated or or compete with them, you really want to learn with them and um, they're going to help you get better um, at the end of the day. So um, I think just like having that team mentality is really important as you kind of try to get to the next level. You you want to be a teammate first. What a great answer. Awesome. And, and, and Carolyn, I'll say this too. We've talked about this on the show that the great players, not good players, great players make the players around them better. Right. And they, they also, and this is the other kind of misconception, they will also push those players to be better, sometimes to an annoying or intimidating level, but they will push you to be the best version of yourself. To me, as a coach, that is the difference between a great player and a good player. A good player will just play. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think also a great person and a great player that you are understood that you were in that environment. I think that's incredibly important. I think that's the other side of it. It's, it's, one challenge to be unbelievably talented and to teach or to share. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to you, but this is the other side of it. It's also to be not the most talented person in the room and to be open to being taught and learning, mm-hmm. right? Because a lot of people in that, they get into me, they close off. I can't listen to that person. They're my competition. So I think a learning environment, which is not always sunshine and rainbows, <laughs> anytime you're creating something new, it's a volcanic, right? The, 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 there's tectonic shifts. Uh, to operate in that environment as both an individual and as a team, when that's happening and there's a culture of accountability, man, magic can happen. I mean, it can really happen. And, you know, I, again, I think about, especially in women's hockey, I think about Team USA and Team Canada. You want to talk about tectonic shifts in hockey, right? <laughs> Watching those two go at it uh, or the challenges that they mm-hmm. overcome, uh, it's intense and, and it's amazing. Uh, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That is great. Also, we got to talk about the little free library. That's your baby. Let's yeah. talk about that. It is. Yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, no, this was a, this was a really cool project. We, um, so at, as a part of my role um, and, you know, overseeing community relations, I um, oversee the Capstone School Program. So 
it went on a little bit of a hiatus during COVID, just given, you know, the nature of COVID and kids being remote. Um, but we relaunched it this past year and uh, we relaunched the reading program in schools. And uh, as a part of that, we launched a little free library in our practice facility at MedStar Capitals Iceplex. And um, it was it was a lot of fun. I, uh, you know, I purchased a library and we had it painted by a local artist, Taylor Campa Olson. Um, she did, she, she absolutely rocked it. It's it's very cool. If, if you haven't seen pictures, um, you can definitely look it up. Um, and we re, we launched it with um, different hockey titles in the library. So um, I worked with the players to find out what their favorite book was, um, you know, whether that'd be one that they read to their kids or one that just has resonated with them over the years. Um, and then I also featured titles from some of our alumni and some of the women's hockey players that have written books. Um, so it was a it was a really fun launch and got a lot of pickup. Um, I'm really you know proud of what we were able to do and um, you know launching that here at our um, home practice facility. And you got a lot of books, right? How many yes. books did you collect? We, I would probably say we, for the launch we had. Um, maybe 50 to 75 books that we had um, and I couldn't fit them all in the library. So, right. I, you know, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of put them out in waves, but um, you know, the community has loved it. They're, they're keeping that library full. Um, and, you know, the, I, every time I'm down there, there's, there's books in there. So um, I'm really excited that it was well received by the community and that right. um, people are using it. Yeah. And what I found is that, one way to get kids passionate about reading is to tap into their passions. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we've gotten letters from moms whose, you know, kids really weren't into reading. And then since we've written hockey themed books, uh, they've written thank you letters because, oh, my son really didn't care to read. My daughter really wasn't all that thrilled about reading, but she loves hockey. He loves hockey. They pick up a hockey book and all of a sudden that little fire inside gets ignited and it gets them just turned on to reading and then so you help develop readers which is that's such exactly. a beautiful thing yeah yeah I it's definitely I loved reading as a kid um I always loved those book fairs where you could you know get new titles I was you know I always had a blast at those so I think just finding a way to to meet with kids where they are and, and kind of ignite that passion and Exactly. You know, our reading program does that. We, at the start of the school year, we send them bookmarks. Each classroom that signs up gets bookmarked bookmarks for their students. And, you know, they're capitals themed. And, um, you know, we do monthly uh, reading minutes competitions where, you know, the teacher's tracking how many minutes their classroom has read. And, you know, if they win that month, they get additional prizing. So I wow. think the, the important thing for us is to motivate kids to, to keep reading and incorporate that into their daily lives because um, it, it really does make a difference and, and, you know, trying to find that uh, excitement and passion in the classroom. Um, I've heard from teachers that, you know, it is, it is getting them more excited about reading. So, you know. Okay. So everybody listening, take a page from Caroline's book, literally, and start a program like that in your community. <laughs> we, yes. we should also mention that, uh, at least as of recording this, the Capitals are the only team in the NHL to, who have done this. I think that's that's yeah. a massive point we need to say here because there's 31 other franchises, we're looking yeah. at you, that really probably should be doing this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, we, we, um, yeah, we were the first uh, NHL team to launch a little free library. Um, so that's something we're really proud of. And I hope, you know, other organizations follow suit because um, I do think it is a, a really cool way to um, bring together community, um, you know, around reading and the sport. We, we should also mention, Christy, that uh, just in case you're listening, all of Christy's Puck Hog books and When Hockey Stops are available in this library and on <laughs> ourkidsplayhockey.com, should you be interested in purchasing those. No, actually, uh, I remember when- Donated, when Christy, right? They were donated There's 100%. Donated. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, and they went I, quickly. I, I mean, yay. I, someone picked them up, so um, that's awesome. Support. 
Yeah. Well, Caroline, Christy brings us, you know, all the, all of us bring opportunities to the show, but the, the, I, I think giddy would be the word to say, describe her when she mentioned this, like they're going to take our books to the free library of the Capitol. I love this. I love this so much. <laughs> right. right. So that, that, that was, that was a awesome part of this. Um, but yeah, no, look, I, I can remember in college when I was a college hockey player, uh, one of the activities we had to do was to go to uh, little schools, elementary schools, uh, inner city in the rural areas to read to kids as college hockey players. And a few things I learned there. One was that to these kids, they, they, we could have been NHL players. They were excited. We were oh, yeah. there. You guys are like rock yeah. stars. Right. Uh, and, and it, until you make that connection point as a young person, you know, whatever, 18 to 22, 23, uh, that was a little bit life-changing, but Christy, I want to go back to what you said too, for the parents listening whose kids don't like to read. You just got to find the right book. Yeah. Um, I, I, and my mother, if she was here, she would say, I, I hated to read. I really hated to read. Then I found the right book and man, I fell in love with reading. Right. Um, so it, it's, this is a service that goes well beyond hockey. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know what? It's tough as a kid. If you're a hockey player to turn down a hockey book, especially if the subject matter matters. So, um, <laughs> Mike's oh, going to jump in. What were you oh, saying, Mike? No, no, I think yeah. it's, uh, you're, you're absolutely, you're, you're on point though, to talk about, you know, when you have children who like to read or don't like to read, like any, any when you find the subject that they like, um, I know like my, my son's a big, you know, obviously he likes hockey and I think he, he likes coming home with hockey books. And I'm actually shocked at how many hockey books there are out there, to be honest. <laughs> with you. I don't, I don't remember how many, I don't remember all these hockey books that were out there. <laughs> you had both of them, Mike. Yeah, but but there's so, there so many like you know history of the NHL and history of jerseys, history of this and that and that. But I think it's but but I think you're absolutely right. If you want, you know, I know like it was funny you know, going back years and years. You know, I took Christie's book and that was our gift uh, to all our eight and under kids. Instead of little trophies and medals at the end of the year, they got a book, and you know, and she signed them all. And the kid and I still to this day, this is what Christie. I don't even know how many years, maybe eight years, ten years. Yeah. Like I still get no, I, I still, when I run into people like, Oh, you still have that book. It's now, oh, and now, and now yeah. it's going to like our grandkids awesome. or something like it's, it's really amazing. Um, But how powerful that is to sit down and read whether you know, if it's about hockey, great, but just the fact that you're reading and, and connecting with your kids. um, If it's a subject that you like and you can, and you're both interested in it, that's even better. So it's really, really great. And I know the NHL clubs that I'm involved in up here, uh, they'll get a note asking where their library is uh, by, by the end of today. I, <laughs> I can see, Mike. Well, the Capitals are doing it. I said, I don't <laughs> know, guys. What's going on here? I mean, it's making, make making, it making, us, making us look bad up here. <laughs> Caroline, uh, so what's, we, what's oh, next on the agenda, Caroline? Do you have other plans? Is you, You're thinking about fan development. Do you have something else that you're working on? That's a great question. Um, well, in terms of Caps in School, we... You know, obviously want to build on the foundation and, and find ways to keep kids motivated. Um, so we're, you know, working on that programming this summer um, to kind of, you know, get bigger and better um, and, and, and incorporate new ideas into the classroom. Um, yeah, I, we, ha we definitely um, are always, you know, working to evolve our programming. Um, one initiative that I'm focused on is, our Hispanic heritage outreach. Um, right. So that's one initiative that I'll be focused on this summer as we kind of think through different programming um, and how to uh, introduce the sport to the Hispanic community in the that's wonderful. Canopy area. Mm -hmm. Before I close, Mike, Christy, do you have any other questions you wanted to ask? I just had a, one question about your parents' role as you developed, and then you obviously showed an interest beyond you know, house level, when you were getting really serious about hockey, where were the parents? Were they driving you? Were you telling them? I mean, because we see some parents who are just, they got their fingers in every aspect of the kids' hockey development now. Um, and there needs mm -hmm. to be a balance. And, the, it, and you know, it has to come from the kid. You got to have that drive. So what advice would you give to parents you know, who see that glimmer of talent in their kids and say, oh, I, I, I need to I need to develop this talent. <laughs> what would you say to the parents who yeah. feel, yeah, like I got to control this because they're going, they're going to play high level division one college hockey. I would 
I would say, I mean, I'm I'm just so grateful. Shout out to my parents. I'm I'm really grateful for all the times they drove me to the rinks. The rinks weren't close, you know, rush hour. Uh, there was a lot of time spent in the car. There was a lot of time spent on planes. Um, so really grateful for all the the hockey parents that kind of go above and beyond to um, make their kids' dreams come true. Um, I would say that I think being a sounding board and, and listening to your kids is the biggest thing um, that I probably took away um, from, you know, my childhood through college. I, my parents were always there to listen, whether it was me, you know, being kind of bummed about a game I had and, and you know, being on the ice for, um, for like the OT loss. I just remember being on the ice for an OT loss in New England championships at Choate. And, oh. you know, my parents, my parents were there to, to listen. And I think kind of, um, you know, giving your ears to your kids and, and letting, and like being that sounding board, I think helps them get, helps them figure it out. You know, I, I feel like just talking things through with my parents helps me figure out, you know, what I wanted to do rather than them telling me. Um, so I think, I think that's the biggest thing I would say is, is just listening and kind of being that outlet, um, for, you know, good days and bad days. Great advice. Absolutely. I mean, like, do you hear that parents? Yeah. Listen, right. Well, that was the key. Listen. Look, listening's hard. It's a skill. Yeah. It's a skill. You know, as someone who talks for a living, I have to bite my lips every once in a while. Like <laughs> tell my least shut up and just listen, especially when my kids are talking. <laughs> right. Mike, anything else from you before we close it out? No, all good advice. And I think, you know, congratulations on uh, your continued success in your career. And and I think it's, uh, you know, the Caps, um, you know, obviously I'm sure there's a lot of turmoil and change down there every time seasons end a little early, but it sounds like you're on track to uh, get going in September again and start connecting with the community. So congratulations again and, and great job. Thank you so much. Thanks, Caroline. Well, listen, this has been a lot of great advice and a great episode as always. We appreciate you being on, Caroline. And uh, for Christy Cascio, Burns, and Mike Benelli, I'm Lee Elias. This has been another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. You can get them all wherever you listen to your podcasts or check out ourkidsplayhockey.com. There are all the episodes, uh, a link to our Facebook page, which is aptly called Our Kids Play Hockey, uh, if you want to join in the conversation. Caroline Potolikio. I got that name down. Thanks so much for being here today. We'll see you next time on Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great week, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.